Welcome to the Living All In Podcast. I appreciate you joining for what I hope you find are some thought-provoking discussions of life, leadership, character, perseverance, and living intentionally in every aspect of life. I'm a business owner, executive coach, and a strategist for business and government leaders across the U.S. More than any of that, though, I'm a husband, a friend, an adventurer, and a believer in what others at times say is impossible. A guy who is out to live life to its fullest and who simply doesn't believe in half measures. I hope you find something in each episode that you can apply to your life, that it inspires you to live life with purpose, with intention, and appreciation for the gift of every day, moment, and opportunity. That from the little to the big, the daily grind to the life-changing opportunities, you wake up every day committed to living all in. Thanks for tuning back in. Over the last few episodes, I shared my story from some of the early chapters that shaped me to the life-changing events that fundamentally altered how I approach life. What it was that brought me to being committed to living all in, in everything I do. We also started the conversation about what that means. On the last episode, I shared my process and some of the tools I use personally and with clients to align daily life with what matters most, the things that really make this wild ride so spectacular and that fill your heart and fill your soul. Today, we're going to pull up a bit. We spent some time down at ground level talking tactically about the day-to-day, and I shared some of those tools for ensuring your daily life reflects what you value. On this show, we're going to take more of an over-the-horizon look at what it is that's driving us. Why do we make time for certain things or work as hard as we do? Why do we eat a healthier diet, work out, or study something new? Why do we sacrifice or give up some things to make time for others? What is our why? The big why behind it all. And when we get that right, are all of those other things, the way we spend time, interact with others, talk to and treat the people we love, and the standards we hold ourselves and those around us to, are there some pretty straight lines between those things and that big vision we have, our why? Now, as I shared on the first few episodes, it wasn't that I'm some super introspective guru who has always walked a great path of self-reflection. In fact, even a few things that by most standards should have been wake-up calls. My first brush with death years ago, losing people I loved, watching everything I'd worked for over years crash down around me, those weren't enough to wake me up or make the kind of changes I needed to have a truly fulfilling life. For me, it took finally finding one of the most significant parts of my why, and then death coming for a visit and trying to end that. For me, just as it was truly taking root enough for me to change. Then, your admittedly thick-headed and pretty stubborn host had that wake up and started on a path to really finding, understanding, and living my why. My true hope is that it doesn't take the kind of pain and loss I knew or the extreme sword of Damocles moments I faced for you to take a fresh look at your life. For me, understanding my why has been valuable beyond measure in so many ways. It's an accountability tool I use to check myself and how I'm investing my time every day. Whether what I'm doing is in service of or aligned with my why. When things are tough, frustrating, or not going as planned, grounding myself back to my why helps me push through. When things are good, when I get those wins, however big or small, or have those moments that are what it's really all about, that reminds me that living my why is what creates and enables these moments And that even the little ones are worth celebrating. And those are steps on the path to the big why. When I'm at a crossroads, personally, professionally, or on almost any aspect of life, coming back to my why, what it is I want out of life, where I want to go on this adventure, helps me make some of those decisions. 
particularly when it's time to take a chance, to take a risk, to take that leap and go for it. A good friend I've been blessed to call brother and coach is fond of saying, easy now, hard later, or hard now, easy later. I'm a stubborn guy who can be like a dog with a bone when I decide to accomplish something, but remembering and being grounded by, driven by my why, makes diving into the hard now a much easier decision. And when it gets tough, I take a breath, close my eyes, think of that why, and it's rarely long before I'm doubling back down on the hard now to get to the easy later. Think about it. How can we expect life to take us to that place we imagine when we've never been clear about where we're trying to get? Even if we set goals or objectives with measurable, quantifiable milestones, how likely is it we'll stay motivated if the only thing driving us is meeting that marker we've set and not any bigger reason, any passion or vision for the big why? Being clear about why is what can drive us and define the actions to get there. Living your why, even the small parts, makes it real. They fuel the fire to keep going and remind us to celebrate the progress toward the big why and the moments along the way that are every bit as much our why. If you've been following me for a while, you know I'm absolutely a believer in setting big, bold goals and crushing them one by one. It's not that I'm against goals at all. I think they're critical in every aspect of life. Now, I like to use the word objective rather than goal, but that's a semantics conversation for another time. My point today is that if those goals, those objectives or targets are not part of a bigger vision of the life you want, I can tell you that eventually it can become a pretty empty pursuit or at least less satisfying than you expect when there isn't much more driving you. If that latest accomplishment isn't a piece in a bigger plan or vision of where you're going. The real key, I've come to be convinced, is to take the time to get clear on your why. Now, that may evolve. Something may happen in life that drives that why to do more than evolve. It may make a hard turn in a new direction. And that's okay as long as it's not a knee-jerk reaction or a way to take the easier path out of convenience. Bottom line, I truly believe that every aspect of your life, your career, your lifestyle, how you use your time and who you surround yourself with needs to be driven by your why. If you've got a partner in life, that why needs to be something you're aligned on as much as possible. That isn't to say you have to only have a shared why. In fact, I think it's vital that you both have your own why. For a healthy relationship, your partner really does need to be part of your personal why. Be a supporter of your why. Make your why more fulfilling and you need to do the same for them. You also need to be intentional about having our why. Having that shared why, the shared vision, will help you support each other hold yourself accountable, and be a powerful force to keep you moving forward together. From that why, your shared why, stems the vision of how to get there. And those guardrails, those path markers, and beacons of light or hope during the darker or more challenging times. Remember that amazing vacation where you didn't know if you'd be gone for a weekend or a month? Headed to the tropics or snowy mountains? The vacation you didn't know if you'd be taking a train, a plane, or a boat to get there. Traveling solo or with friends or a partner? Yeah, (laughs) me either. Look, I'm an adventurer. A wanderer for sure. At some points in life, I've even been called a gypsy. If I'm going to go on a truly epic trip, There's a lot I might leave to chance or fate and what could turn out to be some unexpectedly amazing things to stumble upon. I might 
even not know every place I'll stop along the way, what the final decision destination is, or who I might meet up with along the way. But I'm going to know at least some of the basics. Why am I going on this trip? Is it because I want to see someplace new or relax in a place that's comfortable because I know it? Speaking of relaxing, is that why I'm going on a vacation to relax or am I going to adventure? What kind of trip do I want? One that's tightly scheduled or one with a lot of freedom and discretion to do what I find along the way? Why? What am I looking to get out of it? Solo? With a partner? A group? A constant flow of people I know? Maybe some I don't know. Do I want to be in a big city or a remote mountain town or maybe on a beach somewhere? I'm always up for an adventure, a trip, more memories made, but to get even an idea of where I want to go, I need to do some internal checking about why I'm going, what I want to get out of it. Once I get a picture of those basics, I can start mapping out some of the details, how I'm going to get there, what I need to do to make it happen. And there may be things I have to miss or give up to afford the trip I want or because of the time I'll be away. If I'm going to go on the hike of a lifetime through the Andes or the Swiss Alps, I'm probably going to need to do some training, get some gear. If I plan to go somewhere they speak a different language, I should probably do some studying of the local language and culture. If the trip is about swimming with sharks or going scuba diving to see the Great Barrier Reef, being comfortable in the water and knowing how to use dive gear is probably a good idea. And if my dream is to sail across the Pacific, well, better spend some time learning how to sail and how to survive if winds, weather, or currents don't go my way. You get the idea. It's not that we need to know every detail, but we are much more likely to get where we want to go, to get what we want out of it and to enjoy it if we know what we're doing and where we're going and we spend some time on the things that will make it all happen the way we envision or hope or give it the greatest likelihood for that. Everybody has a different level of planning or scheduling they need to feel comfortable. Some need to know absolutely every detail and there is no varying from that. You know those kinds. Some just need to know generally where they're going and an idea of how they'll get there. But all of us start with a reason, a why. We're going and the basics of how we're going to get there. Now, that's just for a vacation or a trip. What about for the most epic adventure we are all blessed with? Life. Taking time to figure out what it is we fundamentally want out of and therefore in our life, our why, the purpose to how we live and what we do. If we don't know what we want, how can we possibly know how to get there? If we haven't given ourselves time to paint that picture. And look, I'm not talking a black and white etch-a-sketch. I'm talking technicolor so real you can feel it smell it, hear it, that kind of image of the life we want, how can we make a map to get there? How can we be honest with ourselves about whether we're moving in the right direction, align how we spend our time or energy with that vision of our why, our purpose? I find it pretty amazing that for all of the things we are taught, or we go out on our own and learn in life, how to figure out what you want and making a plan to get there just aren't among the things we're taught in school or really are encouraged to do at all. Sure, some people, and I count myself among them, are fortunate to have a teacher, a mentor, a friend, or a loved one who thinks that way and may encourage us, but that's really not the norm in Western society. For most of us, life is presented from a young age as much more of a multiple choice existence. We're asked, will you go to college straight into the workforce or join the military? Will you work primarily with your hands or with your mind and a keyboard? 
Will you have a job that requires you to shower before you go to work or when you're done with your work? Will you work for somebody or for yourself? Will you be married? Will you stay single? Will you live in the place you grew up in a new town or will you maybe move around? A lot of multiple either or questions, even when we are given the open-ended questions, like when we ask a kid, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And on that, for the record, I still don't have an answer and I only half accept the premise that you've got to grow up. But anyway, to me, to really get those questions right of what do you want to do or be, you have to either follow up with why. Why do you want to be a doctor, a Marine, a dancer, or president when you grow up? And I'll argue this is the more revealing and and powerful path of questions. We start with much bigger questions like, what do you want to get out of your career or job? Do you want to do something that makes you a lot of money? Do you want something that just pays you enough to enjoy life but doesn't take up all of your time? Something that makes you feel good because of the work you're doing. Something that's fun every day. And it doesn't have to only be one of these. It's probably going to be a mix. As adults, as young adults, even as teenagers, I think we need to go even a layer or two above the job or career questions, though. What is it you really want out of life? I don't think what job we have, where we live, who our friends or romantic partners are should be what determines the direction of our life or what it is we want out of life. Though in my experience, they do all influence it and frankly, pretty powerfully. Think about it. If you hang out with people who spend every minute of their spare time learning about making robots or with people whose every minute away from their job is spent working out or being active, Chances are you're going to get pretty smart about robots or you're going to get pretty fit. If you marry somebody who goes to church every week, who wants to work a career for 40 years and retire in the same town, chances are your life is going to look a certain way. The flip side of this is true. If your five closest friends are getting into trouble with the law, party so much they can't keep a job, or just like to spend every minute away from their hourly job sitting around on the couch eating pizza and playing video games, chances are you're not going to be competing in triathlons or working in a high-security, high-pressure job. Sure, there are exceptions to all of these. But my point is that too often, we let what's in our life dictate where we're going Instead of deciding where we're going and why and letting that dictate what and who is in our life. I've lived my life by some different rules or guiding principles over the years. When I was young, it was surviving. Then it became about proving myself. Those did what I needed at the time. They got me through. But more than anything, all of these experiences taught me the importance of a simple belief. Knowing your why in life makes all the difference. Answering, knowing your why is not easy. Living it is certainly not easy. These things take auditing your life. Mustering the strength to put everything you've thought, everything you believe, everything that is your life and has shaped it on the table for examination and evaluation. If you can get there and be honest with yourself, be open to what may be some not so small changes in your life, very possibly in more than one aspect of your life, it can be a powerful crossroads. I say crossroads because just knowing your why is only the beginning. Living your why is the real work. But we'll get to the living part in a bit on an upcoming show. For now, I want to dig into finding your why. Before you can chart your course, 
of where you're going, what risks to take, what work you're going to need to put in, you need to understand honestly with yourself and be aligned with your partner if you have one on why. Why are we going to do the things we are? Where do we want to get? What is the life I or we want tomorrow, next month, next year, five years from now, and as we grow older? In a minute, I'm going to go through an abbreviated version of the process I use myself with my partner and with clients to surface and describe my, our, or their why. Before I do, I want to name something now. If you have a partner in life, I truly believe the strength of the relationship will be dramatically affected by four things on this subject. Number one, each of you having your own why. Number two, there being some significant overlap of your two whys. Number three, you both being able to embrace the other's why even outside the overlap. And number four, the two of you having a shared why that honors each of your individual why and that combines your individual whys and your support for one another. The same is true for people in business, though it can be more transactional or with an understanding of its outcome-based alignment. But for families, for life partners, not being honest about your why, not understanding or truly respecting your partners, or not having a shared why will hold you back from having the best relationship, and it will hold you back from reaching your why. Some are willing to accept good enough on this front, I never was, and I'm still not. I feel truly blessed to have found somebody where we do have these four critical elements. No, it's not always easy, perfect, or clean. It can get messy. It can get emotional. But just as not having these things about your why together can be problematic, if not devastating at times to a relationship, the converse is true. Having your own why, having intersection with your partner's why, embracing the overlap and the differences and having a shared why, these can be the foundation to an incredible relationship, a partnership, and a life journey. These will keep you accountable to yourself and to your partner. They can serve as powerful reminders when you find yourself drifting. Most of all, They provide a powerful vision of where you want to go and the life you want so that you can build it together and you can support each other. When times are good, you're able to celebrate that alignment, the dream blurring into life. And when times are tough, these aspects of your individual and shared why can be a bright light in the dark to navigate through those tough times. If you're listening or watching and don't have that partner in your life, I don't want you to think for a minute that this isn't every bit applicable to you as well. There is nothing as powerful as knowing your why and building a life based on that. In fact, those of you who are single listening or watching me right now, you may be better off than those of us who found ourselves in a relationship without knowing our own why or without knowing theirs. I'm not saying that on date number two, you should start the inquisition about the purpose and meaning of their life, but start thinking about it and looking for it in them. In the dating world, we're always comfortable sorting out if we or they want kids, if we want to stay living where they are or open to moving someplace else, if they like to stay up late or usually call it an early night, If you're out there dating and with somebody you think has long-term potential, you'll do both of you a favor by communicating about what kind of life you want to have, what that looks like, and what it means to live a purpose-driven life in pursuit of your why. So let's get into it, into defining our why. 
Maybe you've thought a little bit or even a lot about what you want out of life, what it is that matters to you in that grand picture. Or maybe you've just done what seemed fun, right, or necessary at any moment. Maybe you followed those multiple choice questions we were all given at different developmental or transitional points in life. So what do I mean then when I say, what's your why? I mean, why do you do the things that you do with most of your time? What are those things in service of? What does the life you want to look like look like? If you were writing a novel that somebody would make into a movie about the life you want, what does that look like five years, 10 years from now? We're not only going to live in that ambiguous and far off future state though. To me, living your why is equal parts where we are working to get to and how we are living each day on the path to that place. So we'll backwards map from that future life we're building to, to today. We'll do this both to inform what we do today or tomorrow and to ensure we're living the life we want all along the way to make it real to put some stakes in the ground and give ourselves some specific targets and milestones, we're going to set some future points along the path. I like to use two, five, and 10 years. 10 is a big, we're working toward point. It's important, but it can also be so far out that it feels almost like an abstract concept. Two is a pretty short window. It can be intimidating to think about How much could we really change in such a short time frame? I'll give you a hint, more than you think. But two is also a great time marker that doesn't allow you to put things off into that someday I will realm. And five is a progress tracker. It's enough time to make some really big changes and it's a good place to see how far toward your 10 year vision you've come, how much you still want to be going in that direction. We're not going to start off by setting the goals for each time marker along the way, though. We'll get to that. To start with, it's about that movie script. It's the scene in the movie. The chapter in the book at that moment in time as we follow our character through their adventure. I love reading. I love sitting somewhere away from all the distractions and completely immersing myself in a great book. Most of the time, I have two books going, one for learning and the other to escape, to dream, to spark my imagination. I absolutely love the power of a great author to make you really feel as though you're there in the moments they're describing, to make you not just see the colors of the scene they write about, but to be all the way in that moment, to feel it, to smell it, to hear it when they describe the cool, foggy air rolling in with the smell of plumeria and a hint of the sea in the air, the sounds in the distance of waves crashing, the bell of a marker buoy rocking on the water, and that moment of peaceful transition as the sun's last few rays go from gold to deep red just before the sun drops below the horizon. When a great author is taking you along a character's journey, you don't just see them or read their words. You feel what that character feels. You can almost guess what they're going to say next. And if you close your eyes, when that character runs into the arms of their life partner who has been away for months, you can feel the tremble in their hand, the beat of their heart. You can hear the excitement of their voice. When the story turns to them conquering their great challenge, accomplishing what they set out to do or what others said they couldn't, you can feel that pure energy of pride, the absolute soul-warming sense of accomplishment. This is what I want you to do in describing your why. See, for me... Why isn't just about the dry question and written answer of, what is the reason for doing this? Why am I going to do that? No, it's about what will it feel like? 
What will you feel? What will life be if it's what we imagine it can be? That vision is what becomes our why. That vision, those feelings are what becomes the driving force and the fuel to inspire and guide us. Now, I always start with the 10-year vision and then backwards map from there. I'll post some graphics with this exercise on my social media channels. But for now, just stay with me here to walk through the process. And if you're in a place to do so, scribble down some notes as we talk. Otherwise, find some time this week to shut out everything around you and take yourself through this exercise or bookmark this point in the show and come back to it. I want you to close your eyes and start imagining the life you want 10 years from now. Don't let yourself be held back by, but I have this right now, or I'm not good at that, or I'd like, but I probably can't, or realistically won't. For now, we're going purely and without any limits into the, what would life look like 10 years from now if there were nothing inside you holding you back? What life would be fulfilling or feel truly meaningful? What life would truly set your soul on fire and make you want to scream from the highest mountains, thank you? What is the life you maybe think is out of reach? Or maybe you think you don't deserve? Now, look, I'm not suggesting you get into the realm of the truly impossible. If you're like me and 50 plus, let's don't talk about being a fighter pilot where there are actually age limits. But if flying is part of the dream life, I do want that in there. Same thing for career, for fitness, health, relationships, or anything else. Look, doctors took my large intestine out to save me a few years ago. I'm not going to describe my life with one in 10 years, but you can bet I'm going to describe eating anything I want, which has been a struggle for me or accomplishing the physical feats I was told either weren't likely or was told aren't on the table for me. Focus for a few minutes on the tangible things, those aspects of life you can touch, feel, see, or know about the life you want to have. Let's start with something we've all considered probably at a lot of different points in our life. Where are you living? I don't want you to just say, in a small town, near the ocean, in the mountains, I want you to paint the full picture of that. For me, I want to be in a house that sits on at least an acre, surrounded by trees, with easy access to water. My ideal would be a house with a separate giant garage for our adventure van and my toys, with space for a gym where we can throw open a roll-up door for indoor-outdoor workouts. Space for an office upstairs with a deck off that to take in the views. My house, 10 years, it has a dock where I keep my boat and a boathouse for my paddle boards and surf skis. I want easy access to the open ocean from my dock and plenty of space on our property to garden. It also needs to be close enough to town for easy shopping, a reasonable drive to an international airport, and close access to medical care something my disease and age itself has added to my list. I don't want to be somewhere it gets so hot I can't enjoy the outdoors for too much of the year, but I also don't want to ever see snow or ice or feel temperatures hit freezing. I want to sit on my deck with my wife and watch the sun rise or set over the water or the open land around us. In fact, in my dream, I've got a deck on every side of the house to do sunrise and sunset. My vision isn't yours, but it's this kind of detail I want you to write down. Where are you living 10 years from now? And not just where, as in the location, but what does your home look like? What does it feel like? Go back to that great novel or movie. I want you to close your eyes and feel that place you call your home 10 years from now. When you walk out your door in the morning, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? When you walk in the door, what is it? 
When friends come to town, where do you take them? Where do you meet them? What do you do in the evenings or on the weekend? If you have a partner or a family, what are they doing with their time? Do you want a local sports program for them to get involved with? Is a particular church or temple important? Access to some outdoor opportunities or particular kinds of stores or restaurants, maybe the arts. Okay, we've got the where. From where on the map to what the community looks and feels like and down to the house. Let's talk about life. Let's talk about daily life and your lifestyle. How do you spend your days? Your nights? How do you spend your weekends? Now, do remember, this is an exercise for creating a vision for the life you want. I want you to push your thinking of what's possible, but this isn't what life you would have if you won the lottery. Be well off? Sure. A millionaire? If that's what you prioritize, absolutely doable. A life where you have a lot more control over how you spend your time? No question. That one's achievable for everybody. As we go through this part, and it, in my opinion, is actually the most important, keep in mind that next we'll be backwards mapping to get to this point. If there is a certain life we want in 10 years, the next two to five years are going to most likely be about putting in the work to get there. We'll work backwards and also set some visions for those points along the way. And the life along the way has to be something you want too. I think that's a place some people go way off track with this approach. I've seen it in people I work with. They get so singularly focused on that point 10 years out and how great it will be when they get there that they forget to live life today. As somebody who spent a bit of time talking with death just a few years ago, I can tell you firsthand, you don't want to be putting off enjoying life and then suddenly wondering if you've wasted the gift of the time you've had. Back to how you spend your days. What is it that 10 years from now you want to fill your days? Do you have a career right now that's fulfilling and you want to be doing similar work, maybe on a bigger scale, in a different setting, or at a new level? Do you want to make a career change and by that 10-year mark, you're well into a new career? Have you started your own business? What kind? Is career not really what it's about for you? Is a job or career something you do, but your heart and focus are on something else in life? What is that something else? Are you working out, running, or training for something? You writing, painting, showing your photography in a local studio, or recording music and playing around town? Is time with your church, a community organization, or some other group in town what you look forward to most weeks? What's your family life or circle of friends like? Are there get-togethers every Thursday to grill out at the beach? Weekend hikes, bike rides, or just getting together to hang out by the pool. Maybe as kids, yours or others are splashing around and adults are talking about the events of the day. Beyond that day-to-day, what is life like? Do you take a lot of vacations? How often? For how long? How far away do you go? Is it one big trip each year or do you take two, three, four? Road trips? Are you flying to where you're going? What are the accommodations? Luxury hotels? Campsites? Airbnbs? Is there some place you like to go back to every time, or do you explore new places? Who do you travel with? What do you do? Are they tightly scheduled trips, or do you get there with maybe a few things on your list and otherwise let things unfold as they will? We touched on some daily activities that might involve friends, family, or a loved one. Let's dig in there a little more. What is your social life like? Family? Is your vision and what fills your heart a big group of friends or extended family that get together every weekend? Do you prefer more solo time and getting together every week or two with maybe one or two or just a small handful of close friends? 
And what is family to you? Sunday dinners with a big extended and boisterous family? A house full of friends and family of all ages who come together for a week or longer at the holidays? Or is it going to visit folks maybe once or twice a year and small gatherings? And look, you certainly don't have to lock in on just one answer to any of these questions. It's entirely possible, if not likely, that what you want, and certainly what you and your partner want, is a mix of a lot of things. Relaxing weekends doing nothing, and another weekend doing some pretty epic hike or an adventure race. One night may be for a quiet dinner with friends, and the next day is a big multi-family rowdy get-together at the park. I also think it's critical to find happiness in life's curveballs and in the steps along the way. Your why cannot only be about a destination you hope to arrive at in 10 years. Yes, the vision of that 10-year life is what drives a lot of things. But your why has to also be about the happiness you find on the path, doing the things today that reflect and embody that why. I'm also going to circle back here to the importance of honest communication about your why, about your vision, with your partner. It's not that they have to be identical. In fact, the two whys shouldn't be identical, but there should be a lot of overlap. And where there are differences, it is so important to name them, to make space for them, and to respect them. Look, that doesn't mean I get a hall pass on all the things on my wife's list that aren't part of mine. It does mean I have to respect that she may not always be as eager as I am for some of the things on my list, that there are things we each do separately And there are those things we do because they light up our partner's life. They are part of their why. That should be part of our why. All of this, the where you live, the how you spend your time, the work you do, who is in your life, this is your why. There truly are no wrong answers. Look, if your 10-year vision is living the single life, traveling to every tropical destination and living the life of luxury, that's a why and what should drive your decisions. If your vision is a quiet life in the country with your partner, maybe kids, maybe not, a bit of land to call your own and fulfillment found in being part of your community, that's your why. That should drive what you're doing, who is in your life, how you spend your time. Your why really only needs to be three things, but it's got to be all three of these. Number one, your why has to be so clear in your mind that you can tell me what it feels like, what it sounds like, what it smells like, what it looks like. Number two, your why has to be something you feel strongly enough about that you're willing to put in the work to get there when it's easy and when it's hard, when it's convenient and when it means sacrifice. And number three, your why has to be satisfying enough both in where you're working to get to and in the steps that get you there so that you're energized by the vision of where you're going, and you are fulfilled by the journey along the way. You also need to be able to describe it in a way, not to me, but to yourself and whoever is with you on the path to there so clearly that a Hollywood producer could shoot a film of it tomorrow without having to ask you about any details because you've described them so vividly already. So that's your homework for now. Block out some time by yourself if you're single, if you're with somebody in life, some time by yourself and some time with your partner if you've got somebody you're making a life with. Set aside limiting beliefs. Think big about what you want out of life and in daily life, do some gut checking. 
Are you ready to do the work? Are you ready to make the changes? I'll post a guide on my social media channels for this exercise with some of the questions and the process I talked through today. Use that to put ideas to paper. Sure, you may be thinking, I already know what I want and I'm working on it. Maybe. I've thought that at times too. I can also tell, also tell you there is incredible power to putting your words on paper or for me on a giant whiteboard that sits in my office that I have to look at every day. It makes them real. It makes those words real. It forces you to be real with yourself. Will you look at those words every day, every week and take action to turn your why into how you're living, how you're spending your time? Will you find excuses of why you'll start doing that or doing more next week? You'll get around to it when the timing is better. Do you want it enough to work for it? Or will you get sick of staring at the description of a life you don't have and you're not willing to do what it takes to create and reach for the eraser to wipe those words off the whiteboard? Tear them off the mirror where you tape them, crumble them up and discard not just the words, but the life you said you wanted. It's all up to you. I hope you'll take the time to dream, to imagine, to put to words what you want to do with the gift we all get when we wake up to another day. A dear friend of mine once gave me a quote from her scrapbook that reads, to do anything but your best is to waste the gift. I made a promise to never waste the gift. I haven't been perfect, but I'm committed to getting better at it every single day. I hope you will make that same promise to yourself and to those you love not to waste this gift. On the next episode, we'll dig into turning your why into a roadmap for living and an action plan to make it come to life. Thanks for listening today. I know it's time out of your day that could be spent on any one of a dozen other tasks or hundreds of other podcasts. I'm honestly honored you took the time to listen and hope you found something you can use or think about. Before you sign off, please do subscribe or follow so you don't miss any upcoming episodes and you get alerts when new shows are released. If you're on social media, give the show a follow at Living All In on Instagram and Living All In Podcast on Facebook. You can also follow me directly at Barrick Abramson on Insta and Facebook. I'd love your feedback your reviews, and your help getting word out about this show. You can leave your review on the podcasting network or on YouTube, wherever you're listening or watching right now, and I'd be truly appreciative of any help sharing links to the show on social media. You also can always drop me a message directly on any of the socials I mentioned, and I seriously would love your thoughts about the show, ideas and topics for future shows, or guests I should have on. Until next time, live with purpose, Live with intention and live all in.